All right, we are in Genesis. We're in Genesis 15. We actually just started 15. And so as a reminder, let's read from Genesis 15, 1 through 6. Uh, and last time, by the way, we only got through verse 1. <clears throat> After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly, exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou shalt not, uh, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. <coughs> So we, no, we took notice uh, that it begins with after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram, and the things that had happened in chapter 14 at the end <clears throat> was the introduction of Melchizedek and was Abraham, Abram, coming into a very real um, revelation of the Lord um, in, in the perfect timing. And here's what I mean. Um, he began to see the Lord in an expanded version of what he knew of him. And that expanded version was in a situation that he was, had just gone through and was yet in that he could apply it. That he could, he could put it into practice. Wouldn't it be neat? If we, if we heard something and then we could just go out and put it into practice, that would be wonderful or wonderful. Anyway, <clears throat> so um, uh, he, he then immediately following that in chapter 14, the king of Sodom showed up with all the other kings that he had, Abram had saved uh, from Chedilomer and, um, and, you know, said, give me, give me the people and, you know, you can take this and whatever. And, um, and he, he saw the possessor of heaven and earth as one who possesses that through lowliness, that he, do, he gains that through uh, not being uh, the most high. For example, let's, let's use Jesus. Jesus gained being the most high. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess because uh, Philippians describes him as, you know, laying down his life and going into death and, and all of this kind of stuff. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. <clears throat> so this is the, this is the, the pattern <clears throat> And so, so Abram immediately starts losing understanding how God is. So he loses by giving it away. Here, take it all. I'm not going to, when it comes to possessions, my means of possessing will no longer be grabbing and trying to pull to myself and become something or have something. But I will give and pour out and uh, um, put this in the hands of the Lord. <clears throat> and that way, in that way, he can say, the Lord hath made me rich. The Lord has taken care of this because wherefore God highly exalts. All right. So, <clears throat> verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Lo, uh, behold, uh, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So we discussed this a little bit last time, <clears throat> and that is that uh, he sounds at this stage a little bit like uh, the king of Sodom, 
give to me. He sounds a little bit like the prodigal son. Give me the portion of good that follows, that falls to me. Now remember, this is an immediate contrast to, to the God of Melchizedek and to what he just learned. Um, he is um, uh, he is seeking something, but has not yet given something. He's seeking a son, but has not yet given a son. How about that? And this is the truth of the firstborn, folks. This is the truth of the firstborn. This is him. God gave his son into death. He, the, many times when it says he, when he gave, he, he literally offered him up. He, he gave him up. He gave him up. I mean, that means a lot from a father to give up their son. But he did because he understood. And, and if we don't, then we will just work by the, the ways of the world, the way everybody else works, whether they're Christian or not. And that is you have to work and strive and do whatever you got to do to get to gain and to become something and to have something. <clears throat> and will certainly not consider loss or death or giving up. All right. So... He's saying, what will you give me? <clears throat> and remember, even the, even the elder son was saying that. He says in, the, in these words, thou hast given me no, no this and no that and whatever. You see how that word give is, is in there um, a lot. And... Um, <clears throat> And I put, uh, I wrote down, yet there's something in his tone. He says to God, what wilt thou give me? And sounds as if he blames God, saying to me, thou hast given no seed. Um, it appears that Abram shows no longer undivided faith, but shows weakness and doubt in relationship to gaining the son that his heart desires. All right. Uh, I don't know of anybody that, has truly, truly come to what God would call a revelation of Christ that did not for a period of time at different times go through doubts, <clears throat> go through fears, go through thoughts of, you know, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to get the son. I'm not going to have him the way God wants me to have him. Anybody ever had that? Okay, mainly this side. Thanks. <laughs> um, it can be a dark time. It can be really dark. It can be hard on you. It can be because you there. You know, like in Abram, he wants this son, this firstborn son, and we've seen that all the way through from chapter thirteen all the way to now. That's been the focus. Um, but now, for the first time, there appears to be some measure of, you know, doubt. Um, uh, so, I wrote this. Here in this statement, we're made aware that once Lot was removed from the picture, because remember, Lot just left in chapter 14, um, Abram must have set his eyes on someone else as a replacement. Because, okay, so he comes out of the Ur of Chaldees. He goes to Haran. There's one person that whole time that has been considered the firstborn by him. That's Lot. And while it is comforting to God that he finally got Lot out of there, and you see that when Lot leaves and God comes down to Abraham and starts, or Abram and starts talking and saying, you know, now I'm going to, you know, just, just almost jubilant talking to Abram. Abram is going, there's a void. You understand? There's, he's looking around and he goes, man, my whole time my heart was set on him being the firstborn. Why? Because he's, he was in the family. Because he is my nephew. Because 
you know, all kind of reasonings, and this is, and I'm, I'm using these reasonings to show us our reasonings. We, we assume it's gotta be this person or it's gotta be that person. And, um, or, or better said, let me say that better. We think in terms of it has to be this attribute within me or this place in my heart that I have to be that's going to earn this. We, we would never say earn it, but we, we believe all these different things, okay? And we're going to see it with Eliezer of Damascus. It's based totally on, on that, okay? And so, um, so when, when God is jubilant over the removal of Lot, that, and again, it's not just the removal of Lot, it is the removal of Lot from the heart of Abram that he's the firstborn, or that this quality within us is the firstborn. Yeah. This, is the, this is it. My heart just turned to the Lord. No, don't laugh. Come on. That's, that is, yeah, that happened. So, but Abram is going, what do I come up with now? Right? I mean, there's a void there. So he starts looking around. He starts going, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Or maybe if I do this, you know, it's not always attributes. Sometimes it's, well, if I do this, I'll just, I'll just stay in the scriptures all the time until my eyeballs fall out on the book. You know, like God's going to go, oh, that's really good. Yeah. You know, um, and yet, yet we do our commitment. See, and, and you know, see, I've never believed in going down to an altar and consecrating yourself, because the very word altar comes from the cross, and you don't consecrate something except, guess what? Through death. Really, the word consecration is through death. But we go down there and go, Lord, bless me and help me and. Use me, use me mightily. I want to be used mightily. And God's going, you're in no condition to be used mightily. You're, you're, you're too big, you're too full. No, no, that's why I'm calling on you because I don't have enough. And he's going, no, you got too much, you know. So, <clears throat> um, so Abram starts looking around and uh, and I wrote down, maybe he thinks if Lot isn't it, then I need to figure out who it is or what it is or what I must do. What is the thing that will bring forth Christ in a real way, right? Because Abram is not looking for a doctrine to come forth. He's looking for the promised seed that God talked about. Not the doctrine of the promised seed. It's got to be him, see. So at least he's thinking in terms of reality. <clears throat> um, apparently, he has now made his presumptive choice. And, you know, this is, uh, there's going to be an, uh, other presumptive choices after this, you know. Okay, just so you know. He has now moved on to use the next possible heir or to, or he has now moved on to the next possible heir. This time he has had his eye on the chief steward of his house, Eliezer of Damascus as the apparent firstborn. He has been faithful from birth because he said that, this Eliezer who was born in my house. This is the same Eliezer who goes to get a bride for Isaac. Uh-huh, yeah, it's sweet, except for it's not the firstborn, even if it's the Holy Spirit, right? All right, so, but, but there are congregations and ways that some people put the, well, I did it. You put the Holy Spirit in front of Jesus, before Jesus, meaning instead of the one who takes you and reveals the Son, okay? 
So <clears throat> he, uh, so he's saying Eliezer of Damascus as the apparent heir, he has been faithful from birth, get this next word, Abram's thinking, he has been faithful from birth, therefore he must be the heir. He must be the firstborn. All right. Have you ever done that? Look at somebody and go, well, they seem to have the, the firstborn in them. And have you ever thought, well, they, they're faithful. Maybe that's why. <laughs> and I'll be faithful. Okay. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? But maybe they've been faithful like Abram, who hasn't been faithful except for to keep his one focus being, I must have this promised seed. I must have the firstborn. Okay? <clears throat> and I just think that's important. I, I felt like the Holy Spirit came down on that <clears throat> and that I, I, there's no way that I can name off all of the either attributes or the things that we see in someone else that we conclude this is why they came to a revelation of Christ or this is, this is the answer and uh, what I see in them, you know, is the firstborn. This is the firstborn. Well, no, you know, no, not necessarily. It can become the firstborn in them, but there takes a certain amount of just faithfulness to stay in the word and it, Jesus said it if you continue in my word you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free but the Pharisees continued in the word also didn't they in the scriptures <clears throat> all right so the the point I'm trying to make is is simply that whether in ourselves by certain attributes or and ourself by doing certain things a certain way, okay? Do you know we can fake lamb ways? This is the lamb. I'm laying down my life. Yeah, okay. But uh, I think it was Deb or somebody I told him, I said, yeah, you need to be laminated, sealed in a bag so that air runs out quickly and you die and you're with God. <laughs> And yes, this goes out to the whole world. <laughs> and now we know why. Never mind, I won't say that. Uh, <clears throat> all right. But we, you know, um, we need to recognize <clears throat> that we all do this what I just described, that we all look trying to find the attributes or trying to uh, find the thing to do or be involved with or try to find what it is, look at somebody else and look and see something that they're doing or, or how they are and, and call that the firstborn. We all do that. And most of the time we make mistakes in doing that. We're wrong to do that, okay? Because our, that means our heart is not just set on, I'll know it when he shows up. When God reveals his son, I'll be crying, I have a father. You know what I mean? But I won't be. It'll be him, and I'll know that the difference. I, I'll know the difference. Because, you know, you can say, well, I'm going to come to Revelation of Christ right now. I have a father. I have a father. You know? And he's going to go, you're of your father the devil. <laughs> Jesus did say that, by the way. But, <clears throat> um, but the other part that we have to recognize, while we recognize that we all do that, the other part that we have to recognize is <clears throat> that we have to keep our focus on finding the firstborn of the Father's heart. Just stay with it. Just stay with it. Just stay with it. Not because it's faithfulness, but because you want the firstborn. You see what I'm saying? I, I'm describing Abram um, <clears throat> because, um, let's see, I think I include that in this next <clears throat> sentence. 
But again, there's also something very positive to consider in Abram's response. Though his tone and spirit weren't exactly right, yet his focus was. All right. So uh, the proof that we don't have the lamb formed in us, the firstborn formed in us, the one who's going to die, lay down his life through us, in us, <clears throat> bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus, um, is the attitude in which we approach stuff. Um, again, we can fake all of that, and whatever. <clears throat> um, but we see that Abram's attitude wasn't just right either. You see what I'm saying? But it wasn't just right, not because he's losing it with God or getting off. It was because he wants Jesus more than anything else. He wants the son more than anything else and he doesn't have him yet and attitudes come up. You have to admit that too. We can get off the rails and all, all of us do that too. But the saving grace of that is that we are um, steadfast in our desire for the promise that God said, I'll bring forth my son in you. Okay. And he hadn't even said that yet to Abram. So I wrote, though, uh, uh, in the face of all the recent wonderful things that God had recently said and done for him, yet his steadfast focus is not upon himself, but is directed toward his desire for the firstborn son. All right. So the thing the Holy Spirit landed on when I, when I wrote that was, wonderful things, wonderful things, all the wonderful things. Oh my God, this isn't like being down in Egypt, remember? That was, you know, just happened prior, but not just prior. Down in Egypt, and he thinks he's going to die, and he thinks that his wife's going to be taken away, and all of this kind of stuff, and he's freaking out, and, you know, and, the, and it comes out. And then here, just prior to this, he takes... 318 guys and defeats the whole army of Chedilomer and about five other kings that other kings and places who joined together couldn't defeat. And uh, he saw a great victory and then God shows up with his priest Melchizedek and shows him even more reality of his heart and everything else um, <clears throat> and says, you know, um, I will be your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram says, where's the seed? In the face of wonderful things, his heart is still there. Can you see that? Wonderful times is not necessarily, oh, this is it. You know what I mean? This is the Lord. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and so he's, uh, he, it's almost as if, because you see this. We've already seen it even up to this point. You see this where he's in different situations, and the one thing that doesn't change is the firstborn. I don't have him yet. You told me. And... Again, remember, his uh, biological clock is ticking down. I think it's almost broken. Yeah, it's like, you know. Um, but, you know, he's thinking in terms of, man, I'm, I'm getting older, and I'm not going to be able to have this thing, you know, and I know that you promised, and, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I need to run out and find one. You know, like a girl, where it's biological clock. Okay, have, my time for having babies is done. I need to just go out and find a guy. <laughs> and have a baby. Okay, there's, there's really a lot more that should be said there. <laughs> but, but I don't, but, <laughs> yeah. But I don't want to go there. I'll stick with wonderful things. Wonderful th 
going on. And, and with that, um, so God's last words were, I'll be your shield and your exceeding great reward. And his first words back are, why haven't you given me the seed yet? You promised. Okay, guess what? If it really is about us, we will, we will probably still be happy over what just happened. But he's not. Because his focus is right. His, his compass, his heart compass is still pointing directly towards the Lord. And that that's, hasn't changed. And I love that. I love that about Father Abraham. Had many sons. Wait a, minute. Wait a minute. He only had one, really. You know. You know, and then Ishmael. But we need to quit singing that song. Father Abraham had a firstborn son. All right. I just, you know, I couldn't, when the Lord, when the Holy Spirit shared that with me, I just couldn't get over, because we're so self-focused, I couldn't get over that Abraham, after seeing the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and understanding what that meant, and him responding in the same spirit so that they truly did have communion that Melchizedek brought. I, it's hard for me to believe that he was not focused on himself and, you know, how, what great steps I just took. He just wanted the seed. I just, I'm telling you, that just, yeah, it struck me. And it makes me want to, you know, it makes me want my heart to never, ever move from that and, and to not be motivated. You know, if all things work together for good, bad things, good things, not are good in themselves, but they all work together to be conformed to the image of his son, then I don't have to look at it either, the good, the wonderful things, the bad things. I don't either. I just look at my trust in the Lord and the Father, which we'll see in just a second too, to, to orchestrate exactly what I need to draw my heart out so that the Son can come forth in me. I can be conformed to the image of that Son. The and you know what it says there in, in Romans, it says his firstborn Son. Conformed to the image of his firstborn son. So, um, nothing seems to satisfy or have the power to deter his single-mindedness from this desire of heart. All right. So, so then what do these negative circumstances have the power to do? We, we, we see they don't have the power to deter his single-mindedness and his desire of heart, but they do have the power to make us look around and try to figure out how to get the firstborn to come. It's almost like it's up to me to prime the pump at a certain juncture. Have anybody ever primed an old pump where you pour water in and, you know, well, you know, it's got this thing and you, you pour water into it and, and boy, once you pour the water and you got to pump fast and then you pump and, pump and all of a sudden whoosh, the water starts gushing, you know, so we're going, we got to prime the pump, I, you know, just tell me when, <laughs> you know, just tell me when, you know, it's not you priming the pump, it's you staying with him, I want you, I want to be in your image, I want your spirit coming forth, I want the the son of promise to come forth in me. 
The other thing that Abraham sets forth is that he believes that God himself is meant to be the provider of this firstborn. Therefore, he looks to God for the reason for the delay. Yeah, that's, a, that's good. You know, we can go, what is wrong with me? Well, you know, don't thank God that he doesn't answer most of the time. You know what I mean? It's like, he's, he's like, look. We don't have time right now, okay? I, I live in eternity and I still don't have. <laughs> but that's not the issue. That is not the issue to him. It doesn't matter. In fact, you know, I'll just be honest with you, it's usually the messed up ones that end up coming in because, because they're, they lose all hope in themselves. Now, you can lose all hope and then just get discouraged and, you know, say, I need death and start thinking about suicide. Or you can accept the death that Jesus has already bought and paid for and be dead, not kill yourself. So he, he believes, he believes you're the one who promised. He could almost say it like this. I didn't come up with this idea of a firstborn son coming forth. I just kind of ran into it. You're the one who brought it up. So I'm thinking this is coming from you. And if it's coming from you, you need to do something. Now, I have, most of y'all know me well enough to know, I've had that conversation with God. If you're supposed to do something, I'm not afraid to talk to my father like that. This was in your head. He's going, you're growing up. You're not a little baby anymore, sucking your thumb. You're talking to me like I should be in that sense. This is, this is your desire. This, is, this was not even a thought in my head till you came along. You brought me into a place of finding these things out and you know I don't have it yet and I'm starting to feel like you know I'm not gonna get it you know we're not talking about an it but you understand what I'm saying I'm not gonna get it it just I get afraid sometimes and I, get, I wonder how it's gonna work out and and I know my failures, and I know my ability to, to miss, miss the point, and miss the mark, and <clears throat> trail off. But you, this is you. I'm, I'm back here talking to you. You need to help me understand this. And, and you need to do something. I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm adding this, but, um, but I'm not. You need to do something that will give me assurance because he does in the next verses say stuff that he's looking, I'm looking for assurance. Isn't it? Doesn't he say that? Yeah. Abraham, behold, thou hast given me no seeing, no one born in my. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm going there. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit? Wow, that's some good talking. That's some good talking to God. See, we're always so, oh, oh Lord God. Oh, bless me now. You know. We, 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 we present religious words to him instead of talking to a father <clears throat> that desires this more than you ever could and has not stopped the process yet. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, you know, he would, what would he rather have? Would he rather have somebody that just faints and gives up or would he rather have somebody who, as it were, is fainting and wants to just talk straight to their father? 
you know, show me, give me something that lets me know that this is going to come about. He's not even saying bring it about right now. So because you can't do that. So you cannot, that's one thing you can't do with your father, start ordering him around. And the other thing is, you can't order the timing. It's an appointed time of the father for his son, and that's Galatians 4, and that's, that is the only reason those verses are in there, is because a father wants his son, and again, when that son comes forth in the appointed time of the father, he cries, Abba, Father. In other words, that is a whole thing going on between the father and the son, and we're just, we're not even principals in the play. That's, a, that's, re, that's reality. We're just being brought into what's going on between them. But we're making it like, well, this is reality, and you need to do that right now, right here. In that sense, no, 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 no. And if, and if you're thinking in terms of come to a revelation of Christ so that everything will be, I'll, I'll have, what is it, butterfly vision? <laughs> what are those big glasses? I don't even know. <laughs> By the way, you're going to hell for that. Anyway, <laughs> not really. Just, yeah. Well, it is the Father's eyes. And it is, but... It is the father's eyes for the son, and then it is, you know, the appointed time of the father, and then that happens, and then the spirit of, and because you are sons, the spirit of his son comes forth, crying, Abba, Father, and it's an eternal relationship. It is, that moment is the exact moment that God said, what he was looking for in Exodus when he said, let my firstborn son go and come unto me. It's the same thing. They were in Israel. They ate the firstborn lamb. They put it on the inside of them. And then God's, you know, wants them to know, you're Pharaoh, you're Egypt. You've got him bound up inside of you. You need to let him come unto me. Let him go from you, from Egypt, unto me. Okay. So, now let's just picture someone catching that. Just like, oh my God. That means, that means that there is, um, that all my, all my fears and all the things that I worry about and all the things that I would consider would discount me are non-issues, ultimately. If the father can get his son and can, can conceive that that's going to happen, that's what I want in my heart, then he has every reason to reveal his son in you. Every reason. There is no doubt. But as long as it's like, well, I've got to, you know, as long as we're grabbing Lot and then we're grabbing, you know, Eliezer of Damascus and then we're grabbing Ishmael and we're, you know, and we're going, this is the one, you know. And, and remember, later on, God says, you know, Ishmael isn't it. And Abram, or Abraham prays and says, Oh God, that Ishmael might live before you. Ooh, we'll get there, but I got chills all over me because that, that is not what you want to say to him. He wants his son. He doesn't want a pretender son. Okay. <clears throat> so, that's good. If, like Abram, what's happening here is each thing is being moved out of the way until he gets to the son that the father wants. Can you see the process? It's a real process. So, you, so we go, I keep failing. I keep looking to, toward this or that. And, 
and I'm still not there, and I must be the worst person ever to see the sun. And he's, he's going, you know, you're all bad, okay? You know, I just want Jesus. <laughs> <You know? laughs> You know, there's not better not sons than others, you know. <laughs> it just it just doesn't happen. But again, see, we're, we don't see that father dynamic of this is my point in time, and we don't see the son coming forth and crying, Abba, Father, and we're just like caught up in this eternal relationship. We see it all based on us, and this is why Abram's going through this at this point. This is the why it's hard. It is hard. It is hard, and it's scary at times. And, and, it's, um, and you feel there's no way. I mean, I'm, you know, I, you know, I don't even have time to get in the Word. How am I ever going to? Or I don't, you know, I'm not faithful to da-da-da-da. How am I going to? And again, you know, he's going, you're not going to. You're not. You know, so, so he looks at that thing that you're, you think should have got it. He calls it Lot, and he says, I'm waiting for the day that you tell Lot, take whatever you want, but leave me. You're not the son. You see that? <clears throat> All right, so. Well, I'll reread this last sentence. The other thing that Abram sets forth is that he believes that God himself is meant to be the provider of this firstborn. Therefore, he looks to God for the reason for the delay. Little does he know that God will not only be the source of the firstborn, but will provide his own son as the answer. His own son his own son we need to admit we're not the son <laughs> I mean it's a faster track than having to go through 15 firstborns that we keep setting before him and he has to put us through a process to convince us that's not it <laughs> <clears throat> um, I wrote why after that because he will have no other all right, so verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be the heir. Praise God. Praise God. He will come forth out of us. Okay? So this is a big this is a big moment for Abram. This is a big revelation because he didn't know. I mean, God up to this point, God never said that to him before. So it's, he's looking around here, going, Lot, Eliezer, you know, and <clears throat> so that really cuts down who you can even look at. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, actually not, because, because Ishmael. But at least it cut it down to two. <clears throat> but at that point, that had to be kind of refreshing. Yeah. It's like, oh, praise God. <laughs> All right. I ain't looking out here anymore. Well, you know, God says stuff like that. You know, don't walk by sight, walk by faith. You know, we go... Okay, but we look out here still, right? We're always looking out here, you know. Don't walk by faith, but walk, uh, by sight, but walk by faith. <clears throat> the better way is stop looking for anything external to you from where the sun is going to come. He he wants to come out of you, okay? So. Um, all right, 
So let's, let's address that a little bit. Okay. I know that God really wants um, the sun to come out of our meetings. Well, some of them are bad enough where he would come out of them. <coughs> <laughs> and go far, far away when he does. <laughs> but maybe including mine right now. You never know. But um, <clears throat> it's like I am satisfied with a son that I can baby, not one that can come out of me. I am satisfied with a son that can happen in a meeting, that can happen between a conversation with somebody. That can happen, you know, in some fashion that satisfies us that, yes, the son came there. And yet the father would say, you know, that's fine, but that's not the son of my heart. The son of my heart is I want him coming out of you. I want his, you know, I want his spirit and his nature and his attitudes and his way the way because he is the way because he doesn't have ways it's him and his ways they're his ways but we have to have him <clears throat> and so so we can go minister somewhere and we can preach the son the firstborn son somewhere and people can really go oh my god that was just marvelous just marvelous um, and everybody be happy <clears throat> but the thing that God wants to impact that meeting with is the death of the son the giving of the son and we haven't even got close to talking about that where the where, where you I don't even want to say it yet but it He's, he's not wanting uh, an impact of the sun or an impact by the sun externally. He's wanting, um, he's wanting the, let's say that you're in a meeting and you've got two or three people preaching, which ha used to happen with me, Doug, and Jeff, you know, and <clears throat> somebody says, Randy, you need to wrap it up. Uh, because we got two other people coming behind you and we don't need you to use up all the time. So, And, and you go, well, th but this is really important what I'm saying. It's the sun. <laughs> you know, it, this is really, really, I mean, what I have to say about the sun is everything, you know. And, and I'm in a flow right now with the spirit about the sun. So... They'll just have to wait <laughs> because, <laughs> because the sun is using me. All right. <clears throat> and I've seen this so many times I cannot tell you over the years. And then the next person gets up there and he's got 20 minutes. And it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it doesn't, well, I mean, even if you're cutting in, only taking away 15 minutes of what he shared, um, I mean, that, that's, that's why I'm always, when I go over on Wednesday, I just go, you know, you know, I know, because you always sit back there and go, yeah, go, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> but but there, my point is, there's a spirit behind it that he wants out of us. He defers. He blesses others. He puts others forward. He, amen? I hope Y'all can understand that because, <clears throat> and, and see, it's important because like in those meetings or, or when you're sharing one-on-one -on -one or whatever, <clears throat> it, it really is of God what's taking place. But there's nothing, I'm sorry, there is nothing greater or going to have a greater impact than a death in you that defers to someone else because the lamb lays down his life for others. There's nothing, you know, well, 
You know, we had a great meeting, you know, the end of the meeting after me, Doug, and finished, and people's all talking, oh man, what great, what a great meeting we had, you know, it's just wonderful, you know, and, you know, and I could say, well, you know, thank God I went ahead and went 20 minutes over because I really got to share and look at the response. And the father's just going, you don't even understand. You still think the son's supposed to come forth out there and study in you from your very, this is where I want the son. That's what he would say. This is where I want the son. And all this other stuff is fine, but it's not the son coming forth that I've been calling for. I want him to come forth out of your very own bowels, out of you, out of your being, out of your being. All right, so I actually didn't, didn't address the thing that I had there, but that's, you know, this stuff is so important, isn't it, or is it? I mean, it just seems to me like um, a pursuit of the firstborn son, if we can get some clarity on some things, we won't, we won't fall into despair or fall, feel like we're, you know, whatever. Just, we can just, because he, once we start having our focus with him, he can get you in stride with him, you know. He can get you built up enough where you'll be in stride with him. That's not a big deal to him. It's not. It's not a big deal to him. <clears throat> What's a big deal to him is our heart. And if he has our heart, you know, then everything else is, is his. Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. So let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you that you are a father, <clears throat> that you're not just God working your religious ways among religious people, but you're a father and you, you put your son in us. And in fact, you didn't just put him in us, but you have chosen that we eat the lamb and put him in us, that we feed upon him, that we eat the same food that you do, and that is lamb life, that that's what, that's what moves you, that's what makes things change, death and, and trusting you for the resurrection. We, we love you. We love you, Father, and we love your Son, and the dynamic that you have between you two is eternal. It is not new. It's new to us when we, when we start finding it out, but it's not new to you. It's always been, and your heart will never change. And so help us to lay aside all the weights that beset us, to lay aside all of the, the things that cause us to think that this is, this is the sun, and I will strive for that. Father, I know that we'll do it anyway, but in the sense, I believe that you can open our eyes enough to make our heart compass just steadfast. I want the sun. I don't care what I go through. I believe you want me to have the sun more, and I'm going to believe that, and therefore I'm going to believe that you haven't given up, even though I may not feel like you're with me right now. I believe in you and your heart for the sun. So move by your spirit. Move by Eliezer, who will bring the bride to the sun the true son, the true son. <laughs> he won't bring the bride to Ishmael or Lot or take her for himself. 
he will faithfully get you and me to the Son, the right Son, the Father's Son. Father, fall on those words and make them spirit and life to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your ever present readiness to move us onward to what you have in revealing the Son. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.